All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Sustainable Jersey's 2021 Sustainability Summit presentation, Sustainability Champions Showcase. I'm Samantha McGraw, Program Manager at Sustainable Journey Jersey, and myself, along with my colleague, Veronique Lambert, Program Coordinator for Sustainable Jersey for Schools, are ha happy to welcome you here today. After our presentation, there will be time for Q&A. Before we begin, I do have a few housekeeping requests. As an attendee, you are muted and your camera is off, but if you have questions, please either enter them uh, into the Q&A box or raise your hand by pressing the hand icon and we will do our best to answer them before the session ends today. We are providing a live transcript of today's presentation. If you're not already seeing the transcript, as I'm speaking, you will have to enable that option by clicking the live transcript button and then enable transcript. And finally, this event is being recorded. All recordings and this presentation will be posted on our website by May 28th. And I will let you know specifically where we will be posting that on our website at the end of the presentation. Oh. I also have a few announcements. Um, the municipal certification deadline is June 6th and the final school certification deadline is June 21st. So um, if you haven't already been working on your applications and you're planning to submit, please do keep those deadlines in mind. Um, please also note that a number of new actions will be added to the municipal certification program in July for the launch of the Gold Star in Health and more details will be announced soon. And thanks to the support of New Jersey American Water, we're offering free technical assistance for one community interested in developing a municipal water story, which is a foundational and required action for the Water Gold Star. More information about this opportunity and if your municipality is eligible can be found on the Sustainable Jersey Grants page. We will also be administering $75,000 of grants to fund municipal resiliency and environmental stewardship projects across the Atlantic City Service uh, Area, Atlantic City Electric Service Area through ACES Sustainable Communities Grant Program. For more information about that, you can also visit um, the grants page of our website. Okay, thanks, Samantha. So. Um, hello everyone, welcome. This session is a showcase of our 2020 Sustainability Champions. So each year, Sustainable Jersey gives um, champion awards to the three municipalities and the three schools who have gotten certified that year with the highest point total. And in 2020, um, we had uh, Woodbridge Township which was the champion for large municipality, and this is based on population. Madison Borough was the medium municipality champion. And then we had for the small municipality champion, Island Heights Borough. Um, Sustainable Jersey for Schools recognized its champions um, for the certification program. And uh, for the high school category, we had Raritan High School in Hazlitt Township in Monmouth County. And for the middle school, the middle school with the most certification points went, uh, was Winslow Township Middle School. And then the elementary school champion was Ramtown School in Howell Township in Monmouth County. So these champions are going to share with us some highlights from their impressive overall sustainability accomplishments. Uh, what I'm going to invite you to do is if you are interested in having a full account of all that they did uh, for their certification in 2020, then go to our websites and you'll see the links at the bottom of this slide where you can view um, their certification reports and you can also see their, um, their award videos. Okay, so let's get started. We're going to kick it off with um, Madison, no, sorry, not Madison. We're gonna go to um, Woodbridge. And what I'm going to do is uh, highlight, or sorry, spotlight the, um, 
Oh, sorry. First, I need to ask, uh, Thomas, can you start your your video so I can spotlight you? There you go. All right. And I'm going to spotlight Thomas. Great. And Thomas, uh, over to you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for having me um, and Woodbridge here tonight. Um, a little bit about Woodbridge. So we are among the largest municipalities in the state. We uh, apply every year for recertification with sustainable Jersey. So that's uh, rather unique and we're proud of it. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit tonight about the program itself um, that I get to manage directly. Um, and I'm very lucky to do so. So we have an excellent leadership here with uh, Mary John McCormick and Carolyn Ehrlich, our chief of staff, uh, who I report to directly for all sustainability issues. Um, in, in my little realm of the world, um, in engineering, I get to oversee the footprint management portion of our resiliency work, um, as well as uh, a variety of other different sustainability actions. But for the most part, um, tonight we're going to focus a little bit on things that I get to um, touch and feel most, most frequently. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now. Can folks see that? Yep, we can see it. Okay, great. So, so right. So, a little bit about Woodbridge. We're seven. Um, we are we are ten towns. Seven out of the ten towns have special flood hazard areas, and there's over three thousand acres of floodplain to manage. So that's just a quick snapshot of the entirety of the different special flood hazard areas within the township. Um, essentially, we're looking at fluvial and tidal. Um, so, so we have a coastal floodplain within the township as well as fluvial flooding. So um, overbank flooding associated with, with rivers. But tonight, we're going to talk a little bit about hazard mitigation and the way in which we approach um, resilience, so the ability to bounce back after strong storm events um, as it best relates to nature-based solutions. So. Um, this is a specific area within the township. You'll see on the map where it's circled. Um, it's all, most often referred to as the Watson Crampton floodplain. Um, this area has been significantly uh, affected over the years as a result of uh, flooding. It's not just uh, a new paradigm, right? So it's the elevation at the lowest portion of the neighborhood is about five feet above sea level. Um, so you can see there uh, the intersections between the coastal floodplain and the confluence of how the drainage affects the area. So, right, again, we're an older community, over 350 years old. Beautiful tile floodplains. Beautiful nature preserves. Building community. And, of course, we saw the devastation of Superstorm Sandy. So this is not a river. This is a roadway. Um, and it just shows the effects that significant storm events have had within the neighborhood in, in highlight. So floodplain management overall, you know, what, what most risk managers and floodplain administrators talk about is how flooding can alter the dynamics of a neighborhood, right? So it, we know it affects infrastructure and damage, but what also happens quite frequently we compromise these, sensor, these sensitive natural areas, right? So that floodplain that we're going to be talking about was developed around the 1920s to 1930s, right? So right after the Industrial Revolution started to really kick off. And another thing happened around that time too, which most folks don't realize, is that parts of Woodbridge are actually one of the uh, the, mo the, the oldest uh, coastal beach resort areas. So that when you Google Boynton Beach, you're probably going to end up in Florida somewhere. But uh, this is Boynton Beach in Sea Warren. Um, and before the automobile, folks came to Woodbridge as a coastal a uh, short community. Uh, so this is the late 1800s to early 1900s. Right, so what happened? Well, right, so we can kind of figure what happened, but um, among significant uh, events like, ha like, like fires, um, strong storm patterns are happening at an increasing rate. Precipitation follows that at an increasing rate as sea levels rise. And we see these strong storm events continue year after year in the Atlantic. So now we have monuments and we're talking about mitigation. Right, so here is Boynton Beach, and here is the Watson Crampton floodplain. 
Pushroom Sandy reached an elevation of about 12 and a half feet in the lower Woodbridge River. Uh, that significantly exceeds the effective FEMA flood insurance rate map delineations, which are about nine feet above sea level. The preliminary map, the regulatory floodplain, maps that entire area into about 13 feet above sea level at the 1% annual chance flood, so the 100-year floodplain. In addition to that, there are wave effects up to three feet in some of that neighborhood. So Sandy made us talk about resilience in a new way, right? So everyone started to talk about resilience. The word just kind of rolls off your tongue now, right? Um, and the misleading 100-year storm, you might have just heard me reference the 1% annual chance flood. Well, we saw Irene and Sandy in back-to-back -back years, both 100-year storms, both in back-to-back -back years. This is very significant and it's important to talk about, especially as we start to think about mitigation. So after Sandy, folks started to plan and think about what to do next. So we looked at these neighborhood plans, right? So these, this is uh, funding from the DCA. So we were able to really sit down and, and kind of look at our, our significant issues that had uh, boat rescues way before Sandy. So the Blue Acres program um, is a state funded program that allows folks um, to get out of harm's way uh, is essentially the best way to put it. And then what to do next after that um, is up to the community, right? But it's also state land, it can, it, it's deed restricted. It has to be used for preservation, conservation and open space. So these are just a few of the areas that we focused in on that we knew we had significant problems with. Kuwani, the full view of Fort Plain, Port Reading, Seven out of the 10 towns have special flood hazard areas. And of course, the Woodbridge proper section, the most popular, right? So what do we do next? Well, we already had a great partnership with Rutgers University. So Dr. Brooke Maslow, uh, you'll see on the top left there, um, and her team, Kathleen Kerwin. So they were already providing some great um, nature-based education at the Ernie's, the Ernie Oros Wildlife Preserve in Avenel. And we extended that relationship. And essentially what we did was work on floodplain restoration. Turf grass does nothing for flood storage, does nothing for biodiversity, um, nothing for ecological uplift. So we partnered and we started to develop plans and implement quickly. So this is just a cross section of kind of those initial conversations and, and what that area could look like. At the same time, at the local level, we rezoned the area. So we started talking about how to modify flooding itself, how to preserve and restore those natural floodplain functions. We did that through the Open Space Conservation and Resiliency Zone. So you noticed all these bullet points hit specific points that go on within that, that specific area where we do most of our floodplain restoration work. It also marries nicely with the Unified National Program for Floodplain Management. So in 1968, basically Congress got together and said, we've got to stop building stuff and we need to start thinking holistically about floodplain management. And this is the result of it. So here we are today, right? We're looking at ways to safeguard human life, stop the repetitive flooding, so we developed a new zone. What's interesting about it is that the mapping that goes into that, the regulations, and of course the flood insurance was not going to change, essentially is a three-legged stool of the National Flood Insurance Program. So what about the locals that stay that didn't take it by other now living in a restoration area? We make sure they know the hazards. Before anyone cares about how much you know, they want to know you care. And it's important to make sure that folks know that. So we talk to them. We talk to them about what goes into a flood insurance study report. We go over the data. We talk about the profiles. And ultimately, this is not abstract art. This is a flood insurance rate map, and it's important for determining an elevation certificate risk and understanding the natural importance of floodplains. What about the other locals we have in the area? Well, our invasives, our, th our thistle, our Canadian geese, our white-tailed deer, what do we do about that? We are continuing our partnership with Rutgers. Every single year we do um, outstanding work. I can't say enough great things about the mayor's leadership and the work that we do with, with Dr. Brooke Maslow and um, just making sure that we continue this and manage these areas aggressively. So just in the last couple of years, you can see that in 2019, over 4,000 native trees and shrubs are installed. And I could say happily that on Earth Day, um, we just installed another 300 uh, nice two and a half inch caliper restoration size trees. So what are we doing, right? We're exploring these new approaches to solving old problems, preserving, restoring, recreating. We want less monuments and more mitigation and the ability for floodplains to function naturally the way they're supposed to while we're protecting life and human property. 
All right, folks. Thanks. Wow. Awesome. Thanks so much, uh, Thomas and Woodbridge. So now we're going to move right on to uh, Raritan High School. And I'm going to ask the presenters for uh, the Raritan High School panelists to please turn on their cameras so I can spotlight them. Um, and I'm going to swap out from Thomas. Let me start with Kevin. And I know these presentations will be, um, you know, kind of quick because we do have a number of champions to highlight, but please, you know, if you think of any questions, um, please enter them into the Q&A box for each of the uh, presenters today, um, and we will answer those questions at the end. Okay, actually, I'm going to start with, uh, with, with Mike, sorry. Uh, Mike Miller, you're there. <laughs> and I know Kevin is uh, the next one. So let me see. Joseph Anabali. And then Yeah, you guys all moved on me. I had Oh, there's Kevin, because I know Kevin's running the slides. <laughs> okay, spotlight. Kevin, you're on and then we need two more. And then yeah. Okay, here we go. All right. Okay, you got uh Raritan High School. Uh, take it away. Great, Veronique, can you hear me clearly? Absolutely, loud and clear. <laughs> oh, wonderful. Good, good, good. So first and foremost, I just wanted to extend our congratulations to all of the recipients um, that I was presenting tonight. Hazlitt certainly feels honored and privileged to be uh, with so many great people. Uh, my name is Joseph Annabelli. I'm the Assistant Superintendent of Schools. And uh, with me tonight is an extraordinary group of dedicated professionals that uh, I'm going to introduce shortly. Uh, but I wanted to, what, what I wanted to do was just take a second or two, really just to share with the group Hazlitt's journey. Um, we started this, pro this process back in 1516 when we wanted to leverage all of the wonderful things that we were doing in Hazlitt. And certainly working with Samantha and Veronique held us by the hand and really uh, got us to where we are today. Um, we've done everything from... Um, you know, spotlighting the mindset of going green, um, looking at our environmentally sound programs, but more importantly, ways that we were making the schools healthier, saving money on energy of efficient appliances, and so on. Um, so we are really proud of this program and where we are today. Um, I have to say that I think we've applied for a number of grants, uh, grants and we've been awarded over $26,000 on wonderful programs from all the schools. So we're really proud of that. All of our schools um, have viable green teams. Um, they're bronze certified, if not silver certified. And, um, and again, we look forward to really working with Sustainable New Jersey in the future. Um, without further ado, I certainly wanna turn this over to Mr. Mike Miller. And Mike Miller is our supervisor of side and a mover and shaker um getting us to where we are today so mike without further ado i turn it over to you thank you mr anabali the raritan high school green team has worked extremely hard to implement sustainable practices over the last five years i want to especially thank our green team members dr andrew Petrowski, mrs kathy samiego mr kevin cable and mr bill carl for all of their hard work and passion for the environment mrs samiego hi I'm Kathy Samaniego and I teach environmental science and I'm also a club advisor to the environmental club. In 2016-2017, I taught basics of environmental science with Jim Costantino. In an unused courtyard, our class started a garden project. The students learned how to weed, plant, and take care of a garden. They took pride in what they have accomplished and even made a totem pole under the guidance of our special art teacher, Emily Hamill. The students began to make a positive change. 
Building upon the efforts of the environmental basic students, the green team wanted to take the space to the next level in terms of student engagement by addressing two questions. One, what classes could benefit from an outdoor learning space? And two, what features could we include to make this a usable space for, the, for the, those classes? With support from our central office, the green team applied for and was awarded a $10,000 grant from New Jersey American Water Company to construct an outdoor environmental learning center in the courtyard. Prior to applying for the grant, the green team met with all stakeholders, including teachers, central office, and the maintenance department. We also asked our environmental commission in town and the Rutgers Master Gardeners for their expertise as well. Furthermore, one of our students volunteered to construct two picnic tables for the center as his Eagle Scout project. This added another facet of usability to this space. We applied for and were selected for a generous $2,000 Sustainable Schools NJEA grant to jumpstart our gardening efforts. Our yoga classes, photography classes, art classes, and science classes all utilize this learning space. Good evening, my name is Andrew Petrowski and I am the proud principal of Raron High School in Hazlitt. Our goal in presenting our sustainable success is to inspire districts and municipalities to take the first step in the sustainable journey. As mentioned earlier, an outdoor environmental learning center was constructed in one of our underutilized courtyards at the high school. Our focus was to involve more members of the community. At times, we all know when an initiative gets started, it's only one group leading it. Our programs have flourished because our entire community has bought into our mission. Our composting program connects the cafeteria and culinary arts classroom. Our students and staff from the environmental club pick up bins of food scrapes, scraps and deposit them into two compost bins located, located in the outdoor environment learning center. The compost produced from these bins are used in our two outdoor planting beds and in our greenhouse. Students in the culinary arts classes have used the herbs, spices, and vegetables grown in the outdoor beds in their cooking classes. Machios, our food services company, <laughs> is one of our partners that have been inspired to take the step with us this past year, and they have won the Sustainable Business Leadership Award. Our next slide, we installed a greenhouse in the school's court, court, courtyard. The greenhouse features two exhaust fans to regulate air temperature in the spring, summer, and autumn. There's also a heating unit to allow plants to be grown during the winter. The science department has partnered with the technology education, culinary arts, and special education departments. Students in the technology education department fabrication lab have designed and constructed tables to be used in the greenhouse. Our special needs students have participated in the planting and harvesting of the herbs spices and vegetables as they learn about agriculture and the environment. In addition, our pollinator garden provides a habitat for bees and is a wonderful mindful space for our yoga students to use as a tranquil space to relax. Hello, I'm Kevin Cable and I'm a biology teacher and advisor to the Environmental Club at Rowden High School. Uh, one of the largest initiatives that was involving our cafeteria was phasing out our foam trays and switching to reusable plastic trays. This initially started as a student idea from the Environmental Club and our administration and cafeteria staff were on board immediately. Uh, the support was astounding and we got started with this initiative right away. This was made possible by a generous grant from Sustainable Schools and also PSENG. This involved replacing and uh, renovating existing dishwasher equipment, purchasing the trays, and this program was a huge success when we launched it and students really noticed it and it made a good, big change. Um, other waste management initiatives that our green team and environmental club oversee at the school, you can see on the screen here, we have a couple of large initiatives. One is the Trex collection where you collect plastic bags and other film plastics. It's like a, a competition between schools regionally, and we've collected hundreds of pounds of plastic over the last couple of years. We have the Preserve Gimme 5 program. Number five plastics are not really commonly recycled through municipalities. 
preserve. We collect them, like, you know, the coffee cups from locations, bottle caps they also take, and then we ship them to them. Crayola's color cycle program, they take back any types of markers that are used. And working in a school, you could imagine that we go through a lot of those. So we collect those and send those to Crayola for them to repurpose. And another big one is partnered with TerraCycle, where we have a bin to collect used coffee pod cups. And we actually separate the coffee from these cups because we put the coffee in our compost program and then we just put the plastic cups in the TerraCycle boxes and then send that to them for them to repurpose and recycle that plastic. Reflecting on our efforts here are the following takeaways that we think played an important role in our accomplishments. One, buy-in from all stakeholders. It is so important to develop a shared vision. Two, develop a team. This endeavor is too big for just one person. Work is divided among the team and our environmental club students. Communication is definitely the key. Network, if you build it, help will come. Outside organizations are eager to help. All you have to do is ask. And lastly, apply for grants. With state funding cuts, Sustainable Schools has been a tremendous help with securing funding for our initiatives. Dr. Petrowski. It is an honor to serve with such a tremendous team of teachers, administrators, and students. I hope you enjoyed our presentation and our entire team extends our gratitude to the Sustainable Jersey for Schools program. We have included our contact information if anybody would like to reach out to us for additional information or set up a site visit. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Rarden High School. That was an awesome presentation. And as we transition over to um, our next presenter, Madison Burrow, let me just remind everybody that if you do have questions, you can please type them into um, our Q&A and we will be handling questions at the end of all the presentations. So let me just uh, go through and remove the spotlight from our... Uh, <laughs> And we're going to transition over to Madison. Actually, uh, Kathleen, I think I can just replace. Kathleen is up. Then we'll. Uh, okay, thank you. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Cacavalli from Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee in Madison, New Jersey. It's a mid sized population town of about 16,000. Sustainable Madison Advisory Committee is our green team enabled by ordinance in 2012 with the volunteer members appointed by the mayor. Recognizing that uh, student jobs and internships for last summer were disappearing or being canceled, some of us put our heads together, the Environmental Commission, the Shade Tree and Sustainable Madison and thought, can't we think of some projects to fill the time of these people who have lost their, their op summer opportunities? So we sent out an appeal via social media, press releases, and a borough website asking, do you want to raise a hand for sustainability? The results were more than 10 volunteers, and they were supported by eight mentors. So how did we make this virtual challenge? How did we meet the virtual challenge? Well, first we had an intro meeting, introductory meeting on Zoom, of course, where else, with uh, potential uh, candidates and asked them what their interests were. And then we paired them with projects and with mentors. That was followed by emails and Zoom check-ins and more emails and Zoom presentations. And we even included some green transportation. One of our college students did an impervious cover assessment. It was an 11 page document full of maps and graphs and tables and narrative analysis. And it tracked 15 years of change in impervious cover, um, not it, it, to the level of both looking at it from a sub watershed perspective, there are four of them in Madison, and from a parcel perspective, and even including a map that overlaid uh, changes in impervious cover over groundwater recharge mapping. And this, in turn, I'm going to let him speak for himself. Hello, uh, I'm Dylan MacDonald. I'm one of the interns. I was working this summer on stormwater management, my job 
was to visit municipal buildings and locations in order to identify and suggest some opportunities for green infrastructure improvements at these sites. Uh, this included things like pervious pavement, bioretention or detention basins, uh, rainwater collection, downspout disconnection, etc. As I visited these many locations, I took some photos and kept some notes about what I was observing, as well as any uh, ideas for green infrastructure improvements that came to mind. Then uh, later, I sat down and picked out several of the locations um, that I had some definite ideas for. Uh, I chose the Cook Avenue parking lot, the Madison Public Library, and the Madison Civic Center. Um, and created some more detailed write-ups, uh, including more in-depth explanations of the conditions at each site, the benefits that these GI improvements would uh, provide to the location and to Madison as a whole, um, and images and diagrams to go along. And yeah, uh, I also just want to say thank you all for this opportunity, and I hope you all have a great rest of your summer. Thank you again. Have a good evening. And so Dylan and I met up at town hall on our bikes, wearing masks, socially distances, socially distanced, and we uh, toured these municipal facilities by bike. So that was part of our green transportation. Also, I'm happy to report that the Cook Avenue parking lot he mentioned is now in renovation design stage, and it will include two rain gardens and a high probability of pervious concrete. For the library, the Environmental Commission and Sustainable Madison have met with the staff and the trustees to discuss stormwater issues and the possibility of perhaps a rain garden with native plants. And the Civic Center will become affordable housing, so that's a moot point. <laughs> now, I don't want you to panic over this slide, which is probably the most complex slide in the deck, so I'm going to try to simplify it using color. So the blue boxes are the data sources. The white boxes are the analysis run on the data sources to flow into the orange boxes, which are the um, sustainable Jersey actions, such as carbon footprint, energy tracking, energy efficiency, and fleet inventory. And we, like Rid Woodbridge, have started um, certifying annually. Part of the reason is to keep this data fresh. And we found that with fresh data, you have the opportunity to, to uh, when opportunities present themselves, you can, uh, you can um, take advantage of it. For instance, we received 45,000 in state grant funding to replace uh, dirty diesel earth moving equipment with clean diesel equipment. We have just submitted a uh, grant supported by uh, our fleet inventory data uh, looking to acquire a EV shuttle bus for our senior center. And over the past couple of years, our fleet inventory has helped make a case for hybrid vehicles. And we now have two in our police department, one in our engineering department, and we have two more on order for the police department. Our high school students participated in projects such as a rain garden stewardship program where Henry McCann learn to identify native and non-native plants, a walking tour update where high school students used um, tours that had been developed by a walking club in Madison called the Rhodes, Rose City Steppers several years ago. They walked the routes with hard copy printouts and also with routes that had been incorporated into um, walking apps like Map My Walk. And then they reported their findings on the accuracy, et cetera. The tree inventory project was inventorying street trees, and we had both a high school student and a college student, and their updated uh, database is used for um, documenting sustainable Jersey, excuse me, <clears throat> sustainable Jersey actions. By the way, Madison has been a tree city USA since 1985. As part of the pedestrian audit, Jacob Jordan actually inventoried all the crosswalks in town categorizing them by the type of striping that was used. Uh, 20, 21 and beyond, we had this year a Green Vision Forum for the third year, but the first time it was a virtual event. 
and it's an opportunity for students to present their green visions to borough officials. The presenters ranged from the Madison Public Schools to two universities, Fairleigh Dickinson and the College of St. Elizabeth's. Drew University had a an Action Scholars program and they held a virtual town hall presenting on the environmental initiatives that they had lined up for the next three or four years. As part of the process, they interviewed Sustainable Madison EC members for input. Currently, we are mentoring, we were participating in the high school internship program. Um, our Sustainable Madison member, Peter Freed, is helping a student uh, build a fleet inventory for the Board of Education. And we are in conversations with the high school about other opportunities to collaborate with high school students. So we recognize these young interns um, with an article, a letter to the editor in the Madison Eagle, our local newspaper, uh, the borough council recognized their efforts. And we hope by sharing this story, we inspire other green teams to collaborate with young people in creative ways that further environmental stewardship. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Kathy. That was uh, an awesome presentation. And yes, I do think it'll be very inspiring to some of our schools. Okay, so now we next transition um, from uh, Madison. We go now to Winslow Township Middle School. Um, and I will uh, ask those panelists to turn on their cameras so I can spotlight them. Um, I'll start with Jessica. Jessica, you're okay, <laughs> there you are. And then with principal. Oh, these guys are jumping around. Okay, I think that's still, okay. Ross, you, yeah, you just came up. Okay, Ross, and then, yeah, that's, it makes it challenging because the names are, are jumping around. Okay, and then Portia, I think, I got, I think I'm gonna pin principal here now. And I think I need one more person. Yes, Michael. Okay, there we go. All right, Winslow, over to you. Good evening. On behalf of Winslow Township Middle School and our building principal, Stella Wanguma, who is here on the panel with us this evening, my name is Portia Kitt, and I am one of the chairs of the Winslow Township Middle School Green Team. Sustainable Jersey for Schools, we want to thank you for having us here this evening. We are honored, and we hope to share some information on learning and living sustainably, how we've been able to foster community partnerships and to create a school-wide sustainable mindset. So I have Michael Wepler, Jessica Glatz, and Ross Cruz, who are going to share some information. I know it was shared in the beginning, but we are a silver certified school. We were the 2020 Middle School Sustainability Champion School. And most recently, we are honored to be a US Department of Education Green Ribbon School. So we are extremely proud of all of the efforts and actions that We've been able to do this year. It's been challenging with the pandemic, but our school and district and community have managed to come together and still keep our sustainable actions. Our green team is made up of our principal, made up of our green team chairs, teachers, parents, students, district leaders, and our community partners. As far as our community partners are concerned, when schools and communities work together, we know that everybody benefits. First and foremost, they support student outcomes, they build positive relationships, and they extend our shared vision beyond the walls of our classroom and our school. Some of the relationships that we've been able to build have been with NJEA, Sodexo, who is our food um, provider. They buy local produce for the food that they serve to our staff and students. We've been able to work with Atlanticare, we've been able to work with NEA, these relationships that we've established help us. They utilize resources more efficiently. They help us by giving us access to resources, financial assistance, and knowledgeable experts that guide us in areas of sustainability. They guide us in areas of energy and energy saving. They guide us in the areas of health and wellness, which is very important for staff and students, and in the areas of social and emotional learning. One of our community partners, we were 
very fortunate to work with and our students absolutely love it. Empowered and power safe schools where the students perform energy audits in school and at home and they keep us on our toes. They remind us often about using energy more efficiently. In social emotional learning, we've been very fortunate to work with the Camden Center for Youth Development, our in-house Eagle's Nest mentoring program, community nights with our school and our home and school association. At this time, Jessica Glatz will talk about our school-wide sustainability efforts. Our School-wide sustainability efforts really start at the district level with our superintendent, Dr. Poteet. And this is an image of our school building where we have solar panels covering all of the roofs, providing a good portion of the electricity to our school. Um, the remainder of our energy is purchased through renewable sources. And we've also had high efficiency lighting and energy efficient windows installed. Then with the faculty and staff and students, we all work together on extracurricular activities. So you see that we painted um, positive messages in bathrooms and laboratories in the school. We're planning a bottle cap mural for our courtyard garden. We do marker and printer recycling. Two of the activities that we are conducting right now is our calendar of movement and our healthy cooking digital recipe book. And again, these are all extracurricular activities that all of the staff and all of the students are involved in school-wide. We also participate in a lot of social emotional learning with our student advisory program where students actually meet with teachers for a ninth period, one or two days a month. And, um, you know, we talk about important topics and things going on in their lives. We also held Mindful Mondays sponsored by our guidance department and Wellness Wednesdays that helped get the students thinking um, about their health and wellness. And you see in these images our upgraded weight room that we created a space where staff and students can both work out, burn off some energy and really feel good about themselves. And now I will turn it over to Mr. Wepler to talk a little bit more about our content specific sustainability goals. Thank you. Um, so I'm gonna get into how this all fits into the curriculum. And as you can already see, we focus on the whole child here at the middle school. Um, in math, students utilize proportions. And what they did was they looked at nutrition labels and they thought and looked and researched um, about the drink choices that they were making. And they turned grams of sugar into packs of sugar. Um, this way it was something more tangible that they were able to see. In language arts, um, students wrote essays um, that highlighted single use plastics and the plastic problem. Um, and they also read multiple articles and responded and reflected on those articles. In social studies, uh, students looked at the census data. They had discussions about population shifts and population changes um, and how these changes can affect a school or community. In unified arts, um, there's some of the images right there on your screen. Um, students used some of the issues um, and brought light to the plastic problem. Um, this shows the consequences of when single use plastics enter our waterways. Graphic design, graphic design students created graphics for the green team as well. Um, gaming and coding design did projects that are on environmental issues as well. Health and PE created exercise videos during the pandemic that allowed other students access to important exercise routines, even when they weren't able to be in school. And as you can see, um, we're rounding off with science. Um, we have vertical tower gardens. We have hydroponic gardens. Um, there is greenhouse curriculum in the works for our greenhouse, which will be coming very soon. Um, students participate in the chopped food challenge um, using some of the grown uh, materials. And there's just studies of environmental issues, both local, um, statewide, and globally. Um, and all of these lessons are really naturally infused into the curriculum. It's not like we're doing one day of sustainability. Students really get um, a well-rounded experience 
throughout lessons, um, throughout our SEL movements, and throughout everything else we offer at the middle school. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Cruz. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm going to focus on our outdoor classrooms. We are very fortunate at Winslow Township Middle School to have three amazing outdoor classrooms. One of our oldest classrooms that has been there for, for years is the Pond Courtyard. <clears throat> that allows the students to study the biodiversity within a self-contained courtyard. So they can go into the Pond Courtyard, study the flora, the fauna, look at the fish, the frogs, turtles, the birds, and monitor them. They can look at the flora, studying the plant life there, see if things are invasive, taking over. Um, and then students can also design and build things within uh, the environmental STEM class uh, to support the life out there. Students in the environmental STEM class were responsible for designing birdhouses that they put out in the courtyard. Um, and then they got a little fancier and decided to uh, design and construct uh, owl boxes that they donated to a wildlife refuge. Um, as just like Raritan, we as a school uh, noticed that we had an unutilized courtyard. And oftentimes in the environmental STEM class, my students are tasked with the responsibility of walking in the school grounds to see where we can kind of focus and improve on sustainability. They found this courtyard, didn't understand what it was for, and I encouraged them to find a way of repurposing it. So what they did was they designed an outdoor classroom with raised beds, uh, seating, um, and flower beds, and tried to create pollinator gardens. And I said, okay, so now what we need to do is try to find funding for it. Uh, in 2016, we found the grant through the burns o -Matic Find Your Fire grant. Uh, we applied for it, got selected as a top 10 finalist, and ultimately we won the $15,000 grant, which allowed us to convert that unused courtyard into a, an amazing outdoor classroom. Um, and it also allowed us to fund a makerspace where we have 3D printers um, and various hand and power tools. Uh, it was great to have the burns o -Matic courtyard uh, created because it really drew in local community help from our board members, uh, the local township, the mayor, uh, staff, students. And this was an enclosed courtyard, so everything had to be carried in. So it was a, a, a daunting task. And now that space is utilized for a number of design challenges. Students can go out there uh, and utilize that space for learning how to grow uh, plants, tending to plants, maintaining a garden, we also, as a result of that, have an amazing greenhouse that is being constructed. It's a 1,500 square foot greenhouse. It should be completed in a couple of weeks. In that greenhouse, we're going to have the opportunity to grow hydroponically as well as traditional soil base. So the students will be responsible for maintaining that space, utilizing that space to serve our building. Uh, we also have a project-based curriculum that focuses on sustainable development goals. We really targeted the United Nations 17 global goals. And we really wanted to see how we could make a difference through horticulture, growing, maintaining, how we can educate and, and fight off hunger with some of these horticultural lessons. You can see in the, in the photos here, uh, my students were tasked with repurposing waste uh, like cake cups and plastic containers into hydroponic systems. They were able to design bird boxes um, and just also tend to the garden outside. Every year we order a series of plants and their task is to maintain and design this courtyard space. Uh, and, and they're responsible for the entire, for the entire area. Again, this is really meant to raise awareness of a lot of the local and global issues that we face in the world and see how we can address this. And it's been amazing for us. Uh, we've got a lot of great feedback from the students this year, we've had a number of students let us know that they are so inspired by what we're doing in our STEM classes and our program that they are pursuing this in college. We have a number of students that are getting full ride scholarships. Uh, I had a couple reach out to me, Penn State, Drexel, Emory, Rowan, Rochester Institute, because of what they were exposed to in the environmental STEM class and in our STEM programs. So thank you so much. Much, uh, Winslow Township Middle School and congratulations on that Green Ribbon School Award. That's a, a, a sustainability award recognizes schools at the federal level. Um, okay, so now we're going to transition over to Ramtown and whoever was helping me out with removing the spotlight, Samantha, I don't know if that was you or if it's the participant, um, if the panelists can remove their own spotlights, but that's helpful. 
Um, so I'm gonna swap out uh, Stephen. I think I'm gonna put you on first. I think maybe you are the person who's sharing slides. And then we've got um, Michael Orvey. <clears throat> Oh, I need a camera. Uh, can you? The, I'm sorry, I should have prompted you first. I need the panelists to turn their cameras on before I can spotlight them. So if I can have the two other panelists from Ramtown turn their cameras on. Let's see here. Yeah. Um, okay, and now I can try again with Michael Harvey. And then I just have to, okay. All right, okay, Ramtown, you're on. So good evening. I'm just gonna begin here uh, by introducing myself and my panelists. I'm AJ Bohr, I'm the principal, the proud principal of Ramtown Elementary School. Uh, I have with us uh, my vice principal, Mike Harvey, and one of our green team members, our technology teacher, Mr. Steven Rayo. Our slide shows pretty quick tonight I wanted to go over just some things and just kind of talk about what got us to this point. Um, so I would obviously like to thank the amazing partnership that is cultivated from our Board of Education, our senior administrative team, and just really the awesome network of administrators and, and stakeholders that have helped make this possible. Just to kind of reiterate on what, you know, all of the other uh, well-deserving panelists have shared is it's really a team effort. And I think the key is to start small, but to simply be here and just hear the wonderful things that everybody shared, it's really an honor. And we, we just, um, we'd like to commend everybody for their efforts because we know it is a lot of work. Um, one of the things I just wanted to kind of share as we kind of go through this is I think when we first started, we started looking at this sort of an individual manner that can become very overwhelming. So I think the key, much like all of the other teams has said, is you need to get a think tank going. You need to find out what it is that you want to accomplish. Why are you doing it? Uh, so we just listed a couple of our goals here. Together, everyone achieves more. It sounds a little cheesy, but I know that when you're sitting here and you're looking at the indicators and you're looking at the point totals, those things can seem very encompassing and overwhelming because at the end of the day, uh, each of the members of the green team are also teaching or they're doing administrative duties. They might have families that they're, they're you know, tending to at home. So it's very important that the lift and the burden is much less if you're doing it together. I think that's very important. Much like everybody said too, just to reiterate, you need to look about what is the impact that you want to make upon your school. So, you know, we're firm believers that if you're doing things inside the school, you know, ultimately that life lesson is when those children take things and apply it outside of the school. So I think that's very important. Also, you want to be very task oriented because, uh, you know, time is of the essence. If you sit and you talk with your staff or if you talk with other stakeholders that are sitting here and they said, you know, what, what could we use more of? And you're going to hear time and money. That's it. Right. And so we talk a lot about uh, the available grant opportunities that we have, but also you need to carve out time because this is such a worthwhile project. And finally, just the last couple of goals that we put down is you want to be specific. You want to be deliberate. You want to be focused. You know, time is of the essence. So you just want to make sure that um, you're getting a lot of bang for the buck here and that everybody is personally invested. I love the ideas of, of having students design aspects of the sustainability. I love the aspects of having parents be a part of it, you know, making it a community-based decision. So I think it's great. We've chose just to highlight a couple little pieces of our certification process. And we're gonna just talk a little bit about social emotional learning. Um, I'll touch base a little bit at the end to kind of, um, bring these things together. And really the other piece that we wanted to talk about, the innovative projects that uh, have been designed by our green team members for our students. And then in turn, how our students then design their projects that will help our school. So if we can move on there. So the past couple Is that you, Mr. Harvey? The past couple of years have been extremely challenging 
and taxing on our stakeholders to say the least. With that in mind, it is important to assess, monitor, and reevaluate the well being and emotional status of our learning community. Struggles are real. The ambition, dedication, and professionalism of our staff during the pandemic has been nothing short of commendable. Consequently, we have continued to place personal connections and relationships at the forefront of our efforts as we educate our students. Included are some building level ideas and activities that reflect those efforts. So we've had a survey with the community, including students, staff, and the community members. We've had morning meetings. We focused on creating purposeful connections to start the day and wellness groups, or I'm sorry, wellness grant, a room to breathe, a place for rec relaxation and rejuvenation, school-wide activity days, which included Fun Fridays, World Kindness Day, and Wear Red Day, daily SEL activities. We focused on classroom lessons, including the guidance department, um, and finally, equity, culture, and climate, be the light and change you seek. So just to kind of piggyback that on a little bit before Mr. Rayo goes, is that, you know, social emotional learning is a phrase that we're, you know, we're throwing around a lot in the schools, but during this pandemic, there has been nothing more important than making sure that our students are happy, they're engaged, and they're productive. You know, we have a lot of gains that we, we have to uh, work with our students and our parents and our, our staff to get everything back up to speed. But those personal connections to start the day, check-ins throughout the day and to end the day, they have to be purposeful and they have to be meaningful because when they go home, we need to make sure that their day was an effective one. So as we move on to uh, different innovative projects that we have accomplished throughout Ramtown, um, going off of what Raritan and Winslow said as the other two schools, even though we're speaking as schools, three schools here, overall it does have a lot of support from the district office, the board of education. They're very supportive of these programs that we work on. Um, Something that we've partnered with is the Master Gardeners out of Rutgers. Uh, Pat Eisenman, who is a Master Herb Gardener, actually came down to our school to speak with our third grade students to discuss what would be perfect to plant in our garden. What you know, what plants may may work, and what are the benefits of certain herbs to our school garden inside our, our courtyard. Uh, a perfect way that we got started a few years ago was through a previous school talked about the, uh, the Power Save Schools, the Alliance to Save Energy, where we did green energy audit teams. Our assistant superintendent, uh, Mr. Sanisak, brought that over to our school. And uh, Mr. Moore, we, me and him, we discussed it with our students and we had our, our green team go along. They had their shirts on that day and they did energy audits around the school. And then we discussed these results with our custodian team to see what's the best way that we could save energy. Uh, we caught our teachers, you know, leaving projectors on and we we gave them like a, a ticket. Hey, we saw that you left your projector on. Let's make sure we shut it off or making sure the lights are going off as they leave the classroom. One of the things that the district has done, you know, our light switches now turn off automatically after inactivity in the room. So those are some things that we saw out of our green energy audit teams. An innovative project that we were actually able to work on this year uh, during uh, remote learning, hybrid learning, and also being inside the classroom, we held a full day activity with our students that actually came out of applying for a grant. So we wanted to apply for the PSCG grant by uh, creating an outdoor learning space for students. Who would be the best to turn to for what should be an outdoor learning space? The students. So we actually created a day and aligned it to New Jersey State Learning Standards, where we had students uh, research with um, resources that we collected for them. Then they also created a budget using Google Sheets 
And then at the end of the day, they use Google drawings and Google slides to actually take a map and they created a map of what the outdoor learning spaces would look like. So they had the freedom to really design the classroom and what it would look like for students of the future of Ramtown. Because one of our mottos is, once you're a Ram, you're always a Ram. Um, so moving on from that in previous years, and we'll continue to partner with uh, different organizations such as Semper Fido, which their main goal is their nonprofit organization committed to the rehabilitation of service members that may have been diagnosed with uh, traumatic brain injuries or PTSD. And that's something that Mr. Boar is going to talk a little bit more about how we are with our community when we're talking about Veterans Day and different community projects. Thank you. Just our final slide. Um, you know, at the end of the day, through this pandemic and, and all of the challenges that we've you know, sought and that we've been through, the end goal is to remain focused on the well-being and success of, of our students. And I guess in the simple fact is when children come to school and when teachers first start out and they, you know, they want to change the life of a child, you know, each day, each minute, the positive impact is really what we're talking about. And it's been harder to do in this pandemic, but we want to make learning fun. We want children to want to be in school. We want teachers to want to come to school and teach these children. So at the core of everything is just remember why we got into this professional. So, you know, the last slide is just from classroom to community, one team, one dream. Everybody's in this together. I love the reference from one of the other panelists about uh, the United Nations global goals. You know, we, we have to you know, fix the things that are broken and we have to make sure that our, our children are moving through life and through our profession in a positive manner. So we just listed a couple of things that we love our military at Ramtown School. Every year we hold a Veterans Day Assembly. It's grown. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we weren't able to have it last year, but we've had a time 60 to 80 veterans and their family members, those have served in World War II. We take opportunities to bring our parents and grandparents in. So one of the examples here, we do opening, opening day baseball lunches, you know, we have some hot dogs and some hamburgers and, um, you know, we like to have a good time. We also are, are very appreciative when the holidays roll around to do Thanksgiving lunches and, you know, reflect on those that may not be a little uh, unfortunate. We hold enrichment days where we give students choices to participate in the special areas and including maker spaces and designing learning and engaging in activities that they choose. We have STEAM days, which, which link our engineering, our math, uh, our science, our technology. So we have days dedicated to that. And one of the things, you know, just to piggyback that Mr. Rayo had shared, um, we're the Ramtown Rams. We call ourselves one big happy Ramley. I know it's cheesy, but one of the things that we've been able to sustain some of our projects is we have students that continuously reach out because they want to give back to the school that positively impact them. So in our courtyards, we have birdhouses, we have bat boxes, we have landscaping planters. Um, our most recent alumni came back and, and created gardens for us. And usually when they come back as part of the Eagle Scouts, they come back as an entire scout pack because they're all committed in um, helping improve our school. So that's really the message. I, I just want to again say, you know, it's really an honor to be here. And when we started this process years ago, it seemed like that we would never be sitting here because it, it was it was tough. But, it, you know, certainly if we can do it, everybody else can do it. And uh, feel free to reach out and we'd be more than happy to help anybody um, move to the next level, whatever their goal may be. So thank you for having us tonight. It was a pleasure. Thank you so much, Ramtan. And thank you, especially for those inspirational <laughs> words at the end. Um, I certainly appreciate that. And I'm sure everybody else does. Okay, so um, we're going to transition now to Island Heights. So as I uh, remove the spotlights from Ramtown, if uh, Tanar, if you can turn your uh, camera on. So let's see, we'll remove spotlight from... Um, Hang on a second. Okay. 
and then <laughs> Stephen. Sorry, sorry, it's taking me so long. I'm, I'm leaving you guys hanging out in the spotlight there. It's just uh, sometimes it's challenging to find it's in a very long list. Okay, Chanara, are you ready? Let me find. I'm ready. Okay, uh, so Tanara is going to tell us about um, Island Heights, which is a municipal uh, small champion. All right, Tanara, over to you. Well, hi, everyone. Uh, good evening, and thank you for having us. It's such an honor to be one of the champions and be here. Um, so our presentation is a little different. Um, let me just put it here. All right. So, um, well, for uh, those of you that don't, don't know where Island Height is, uh, well, we're a really small town in Ocean County. We're right on the Barnica Bay, and we are a very unique community full of um, gardeners, volunteers, and people that love art in general. Um, our population is 1,691, that's the estimate for 2021, but we have over 12 volunteer groups and they are pretty active, I can tell you that. Um, a sustainable Island Heights or uh, the Island Heights Green Team on an environmental committee, our goal is to create cooperative opportunities between community groups. So instead of trying to uh, come up with uh, crazy projects that might be difficult uh, to achieve by ourselves. We try to just get everyone to work together uh, so we can do more and have a bigger impact in our community. So these are just one, ex this is just one example of one of the lists that we created. Um, I'm sorry if I'm missing anyone and I'm sure we have even more volunteers than that. But uh, they all do such an amazing job, and we really try to support each other. We try to work together, uh, share projects and ideas. Um, and as the environmental committee, we're really big into trying to share it, their posts and events to get more people involved in any project they do or any activity. Um, some examples might be the flower cell for the um, Island Heights First Aid Squad. Um, the church has so many amazing events. They have um, the breakfast, and all of these are fundraisers to do amazing projects right here in our community. So we really try to get everything out there for everyone to see it. Uh, we try to compile everyone's activities and also look for needs in our community. Um, so I, I believe the key and the reason why um, we have such a great success so far is because we're trying to partner up and we find also nonprofits from Ocean County and local businesses and of course our local government. Uh, so our advice to everyone and just a way to share our joy is just some tips to make your green team grow. Um, we definitely grew in volunteers uh, and we're always looking for more volunteers. Um, our things, things that we like to always take into consideration is that absolutely everyone and anyone can volunteer. It doesn't matter if you are a little tiny um, toddler or if you are 100 years old, everybody can give something to the community and that's something amazing about volunteering. Uh, we love new ideas um, and that's the way any community grow. Um, we always try to tell people just give it a try no idea is too crazy no idea is too small or too big just give it a try and um, we try to look for local talent and use every resource we have in our community uh we love empowering our team and everyone can do something so that's just the way um to get projects out there uh, and start working them up and we love to collaborate with other organizations too Tanara, uh, uh, Tanara, excuse me, I, your, your slides are not advancing. I think you want to probably enable your editing and, um, yeah, advance oh. your slides so we can, because you've got oh, beautiful so slides. Sorry. There you go. Thank you. All right, so that was the first slide. Now that was the second one. And I'm, I apologize for that. Um, but then that's um, the other slide. And that was right here now. 
So our latest event was Earth Day, and it came out as such an amazing, an amazing event that I was so happy to just to see everything. And I know everyone that participated was so happy as well. Um, we tried to do something low key because of COVID. We didn't want to go crazy, uh, but we still had an amazing participation. And what we did was um, just invite everyone to do a town cleanup. They could do their own and just send us their pictures. Uh, or you can come, sign up, and get, you know, a garbage bag, a recycling bag, and, um, and some gloves and some other tools. Uh, we did a biosol planting. Uh, we were giving out seedlings and some seeds, all native plants. Uh, we were also doing our zero waste station. Uh, we did a used toy drive and scavenger hunt. And I'm just going to show you some pictures real quick. Mm -hmm. So we've been doing this for a couple of years now. And it's just so rewarding because we just get all of these toys that parents are in need to get out of their homes. And we just find a new home for them. And this wouldn't be possible without second chance toys and the support of the whole community. Uh, we get these toys, we clean them up, and then an organization in need will come and pick them up. In this case, it was Ocean Inc. We worked with them uh, for a couple of times now. And we collected over 50, uh, maybe a 1,000 toys. That we didn't count them, but that was uh, our estimate. And um, so it was such a beautiful activity that takes really not too much time. And the planning is very simple, and it just has such a good impact, reducing waste and making children happy then we also had um the bio swell planting we had a great amazing project that uh came years ago and it was funded by the sustainable jersey and the bseg grant and um we did this green infrastructure to control the flooding that was happening in our parking lot at the municipal building um and this year we got a mini grant from the native plant society of new jersey and we were able to add new species native, of course, to our bio swell. And it was amazing. We got the scouts helping out and so many neighbors helping out to get this accomplished. And the bio swell gave us things back because the native grasses were spreading so much that we were able to dig them out and give them away to our um, neighbors. I kept some myself and, and they're doing great. And we also did our zero waste collection and the composting drive is not from this event, but it's just an example that um, you can just think about some everyday items you throw out and there, there is always gonna be a way to dispose them uh, differently than sending them to the landfill. So these are some of the items we take from our residents um, during the year. They will contact us through Facebook or Instagram, and we will schedule a drop of, of a pickup. And uh, also during the farmer market season, we have a stand where we collect all of these okay. items and we send them to different places uh, like Terra Cycle or Call to Recycle or any other that we can uh, find them on. And well, because we only had 10 minutes, that was very quick, but I hope you got inspired and you learned something about us. And if you want to learn more, just um, Find us on Facebook and Instagram, and we're always posting our uh, projects there. And just a quick thing, uh, don't wait on perfect conditions for success to happen. Just go ahead and do something. And that's the way to get somewhere. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tanara, and the uh, great words of advice at the end there. Don't wait for perfect conditions just to do something. Um, all right, so I think, uh, sure. So uh, some, I'm gonna turn it back over to Samantha as we are approaching the end of our session here. Yeah, just a few quick things to wrap up the session this evening. We just wanna thank all of our sustainability summit sponsors for their support of the program and this uh, virtual long week of events. We do still have, um, you know, another four days of um, different types of events coming up. Uh, just a few things to highlight. We have trivia night tomorrow. Um, there's a $150 team prize. Um, we have a session on building a sustainable workplace culture. 
on Wednesday or um, yeah, I'm one, on Wednesday, I'm sorry, that says 518. Uh, the Sustainable Jersey Tag Team session is also on Wednesday. Um, that'll be a great session about collaboration between municipal and school green teams. Um, and then there's a session about the new Sustainable Jersey for Schools digital program, digital schools program on Friday. Um, and as I mentioned, all of our sessions will be posted on our website. Um, you'll be able to find that on the resources, Sustainability Summit, page. And that's it. And um, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, and, you know, we do have a little bit of time for questions. So um, let's see if any questions came in, Veronique. Uh, I didn't see any questions come into the Q&A. I think I just saw uh, in passing, there was a single que question I noticed in chat. I think it was from Kathy. Was it, um, I forget what it was about, uh, she. Yes. I, um, I did see a question uh, which was for Winslow, which is uh, what is a chopped food challenge? Uh, so the students have to use ingredients that they've grown in the garden and create healthy dishes out of those herbs and vegetables that they've grown. And then they share it with their fellow classmates. So it's kind of, is it is it similar to the uh, Chopped uh, show on Food Network? Yes, yes, where you, you have these set ingredients and you know, you have to make something delicious with it. it sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, that does sound like a lot of fun, thanks. Uh, for sharing that. So I get, yeah, we're actually a couple of minutes over time, but you know, there's so few people on. So I guess if anybody had a question or a comment they wanted to share, um, you know, you could either type it at this point, I guess, in the chat or in the Q and A, or you could even um, raise your hand and uh, I think we can unmute attendees, right? I mean, the panelists yes. can unmute themselves and speak if they want, uh, the attendees would need to raise their hand. But um, yeah, but I know there were certainly a lot of great ideas and uh, for collaboration. So hopefully too, this, I mean, this is a nice thing about the summit. It's an event where that we have like intermixing in between our municipal and our schools program. So, you know, the idea is to uh, spark, um, you know, awareness of each other and uh, which hopefully will lead to, uh, you know, greater collaboration between the municipal uh, world and the school's world. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything else, Veronique. Okay, well, you know, they have our, you guys have our contact information. Um, I know that some of the panelists put their contact information up in the slides. If you did not have a chance to uh, make a note of that, and there, you know, you do have a question for one of our panelists. You can always reach out to me or to Samantha, and uh, we know how, who these guys all are. We know how to find them. <laughs> we can certainly pass those questions on, or even put you in direct contact with them. Um, so thank you so much, everybody, and thank you to our awesome panelists um, for you know showcasing the fantastic sustainability work that's going on in your towns and in your schools. Um, it was a lot of fun to, to hear about what's going on there. Yes, thank you so much, everyone. Hi. Enjoy the rest of your <laughs> evening.